Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the Office of Tax Appeals Morning Calendar. Uh, this is the second of three appeals that will be heard today. I'm Josh Aldrich. I'm joined by Administrative Law Judges Teresa Stanley and Keith Long. Uh, today's oral hearing for the appeal of AS Swipe Incorporated doing business as Lucky 13 will be live streamed and transcribed. Our stenographer, Ms. Alonzo, is also present and she's re reporting this hearing verbatim. To ensure that we have an accurate record, we ask that you speak one person at a time and please be sure to speak directly into the microphone. If needed, the stenographer may stop the hearing process and ask for clarification. She may also ask you to slow your rate of speech. After the hearing, the stenographer will produce the official hearing transcript which will be available on the Office of Tax Appeals website. To help the hearing run smoothly, please state your name before you speak. Please remember to be professional. For example, do not interrupt one another. Please use appropriate language and please mute your microphone if you're not actively speaking. Once again, these proceedings are being broadcast live and any information shared is publicly viewable. Should someone lose their connection, my panel members or I may pause the hearing to address a connectivity issue. Once we go on the record, we will confirm the issues, go over the exhibits and address other matters. Uh, with that said, are there any questions before we go on the record? Um, Mr. Spears, do you have any questions? So I, this is an unfamiliar format. I've done a lot of Zoom. Where, where do you mute? Oh, I see it when I want to mute. Okay, I see it down here. Okay, good. I think I'm good. Okay, and Ms. Weiss? <clears throat> I don't think I have any questions. Mr. Suazo? No questions. Great. And um, uh, Ms. Alonzo, are you ready to proceed? Getting a, I got a thumbs up from Ms. Alonzo, so we're going to go on the record. Uh, this is Judge Aldrich. We're opening the record in the appeal of AS Swipe Incorporated, doing business as Lucky 13 before the Office of Tax Appeals. OTA case number 22041026. Today's date is Friday, June 16th, 2023, and it's approximately 10.30 a.m. This hearing was noticed for a virtual hearing and is being heard by a panel of three administrative law judges. My name is Josh Aldrich. I'm the lead for purposes of conducting the hearing. I'm joined by judges Teresa Stanley and Keith Long. During the hearing, the panel members may ask questions or otherwise participate to ensure that we have all the information needed to decide this appeal. After the conclusion of the hearing, we three will deliberate and decide the issues presented. As a reminder, the Office of Tax Appeals is not a court. It is an independent appeals body. The panel does not engage in ex party communications with either party. Our opinion will be based on the party's arguments, the admitted evidence, and the relevant law. And we have read the party submissions. We are looking forward to hearing your arguments today. Uh, who is present for the appellant? Could you repeat that? Who is present for the appellant, AS Swipe Incorporated? Uh, we can uh, begin with myself, I'm Brian Spears. I'm the owner, and Laura Weiss, who is a bookkeeper who worked on the uh, audit appeal with me. Thank you. And who is present for CDTFA, beginning with the hearing representative? Ms. Swazo, hearing representative, CDTFA. Jason Parker, Chief of Headquarters Operations Bureau with CDTFA. Christopher Brooks, TAPS Counsel for CDTFA. Thank you. Um, so the issues to be decided are as follows. Uh, whether appellant has shown that adjustments are warranted to the audited taxable measure, one. And the second is whether interest relief is warranted. Um, regarding exhibits, uh, pursuant to the May 30th, 2023 minutes and orders, CDTFA's exhibits A through I were admitted into the record without objection. Also appellants exhibits one through 16 were admitted into the record. Uh, but after the pre-hearing conference, appellants submitted, timely submitted exhibits 17 and 18. Uh, likewise, CDTFA timely submitted exhibits J and K. Uh, so this question is for appellant or Mr. Spears. Uh, do you have any objection to CDTFA's exhibits J and K? Oh, no, I don't. Okay, similar question for CDTFA. Do you have any objections to exhibits 17 and 18? No objections. All right, hearing no objections, we're going to admit exhibits 17 and 18 also into the record, as well as exhibits J and K into the record. Okay, 
Uh, regarding uh, witness testimony, uh, Mr. Spears, I did not see any cor correspondence indicating that you'd be testifying today. And before we get started, I want to make sure that that's accurate. If not, um, so is that accurate, Mr. Spears? No, we, 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 I, okay, first of all, this is a new format for me. I've never been here before, and neither is Laura, but the intent that we, we were going to both uh, speak today. Laura will handle most of the uh, appeal that we're presenting today, but I'll also speak to my ownership role. So speaking um, could be in the form of an argument or testimony. We discussed this a little bit during the pre-hearing conference, uh, what the difference is. Um, are you saying that you'd like to testify? No. I believe we're both just pre presenting oral arguments. Yeah, we're just presenting the oral arguments. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the clarification there. Um, so there won't be any witness testimony. Um, oh, yeah, there's no witness testimony, correct. Great. Um, so I'm just going to give you a recap of how the hearing will proceed. So uh, after this part, we'll begin with appellant's opening presentation, and we allotted 45 minutes for that. Like I said, if you need to make um, changes to that, you can waive time, ask for more time. Next, we'll uh, switch over to CGTFA's combined opening and closing statement for 30 minutes. Then the panel will ask questions for about five to 10 minutes. And then uh, appellant will have the opportunity to give closing remarks or rebuttal. Um, like I said, these are made for calendaring purposes. Uh, if you need additional time or wish to wait for time, please let me know. Uh, unless there's questions, uh, we're going to proceed with appellant's opening statement. Uh, Mr. Spears, are you ready to begin? Yes, I am. Okay. So, uh, as I just mentioned, this is, uh, first of all, I wanna thank everybody for taking the time to hear this. It's been a long, long process. Um, a lot of it probably due to COVID. I think this took a lot longer than any of us expected, especially Lauren and I, but we understand part of the reasons. I appreciate everybody here and, and, and our opportunity to you know, give our oral arguments of why we still feel there should be adjustments made based on this particular business and its particular nuances. Um, Laura, who I engage with to help me after I got my initial audit re, uh, results, which were very, very high, and you'll see have come down, uh, is, will speak initially, and she'll try to detail where we still feel there is room for further adjustment. And following L Laura's uh, oral arguments, I'm going to just speak and discuss you know, the business model a little bit, the my ownership role, and why that is in this particular situation, I think material to the overall uh, arguments we're making and, and the evaluation of this business and, and the numbers that we've come up with. So uh, thanks again, and I'm gonna now turn it over to Laura. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody's time today. As you know, we're here to appeal the outstanding balance of the sales tax audit of As Swipe Inc., which we will both refer to from here on out as the lucky 13. Um, I would like to begin our presentation by giving a brief, brief history of the business and the audit as it helps to establish the context of the remaining disputed requests for adjustment. The lucky 13 was a niche business a neighborhood dive bar known for fast, cheap, and strong drinks, free barbecues every Saturday in the summer, free popcorn, terrifying bathrooms, pool tables, picnic tables on a patio, and an abundance of dogs. Just to give a picture of what this looked like. The appellant will give you a description of the investment he made and the unique issues with the building the Lucky 13 lease that will give context to why the business never attempted to maximize profits, maintain its operating equipment or leasehold assets, or bothered to upgrade to expensive POS hardware systems or credit card equipment. When the appellant received the preliminary audit report from the CDTFA field auditor, Mr. Thomas Chow, which I included as Exhibit 18, page 1, I was tasked with reviewing the calculations in this report because of what Mr. Spears felt was an astounding and erroneous estimate of underreported sales. 
I believe a brief review of the history of the audit will emphasize the two outstanding disputed items. You can see on line 24, column E of exhibit 18, that Mr. Chow, using CDTFA standard auditing protocols, determined that the Lucky 13 had a $1,792,154 in underreported sales. During the initial audit period and the appeal with the CDTFA, I addressed multiple issues that were corrected. Many of these can be viewed in exhibit four, pages 46 to 76, titled audit chronology. And they include failure to categorize liquor, beer, and wine correctly in the analysis of invoices, failure to separate mixers from the markup calculation, and incorrect reporting of premium liquor prices likely due to communication issues. <clears throat> and though these inaccuracies in the work of the auditor had an impact on the assessed underreporting, the most significant adjustments that we argued and appealed are related to mathematical inaccuracies that are utilized within the audit process. In particular, there are multiple areas where the CDTFA audit procedures require the utilization of gross sales percentages or gross markup percentages instead of utilizing gross cost percentages to calculate their estimate of possible sales given the Lucky 13's purchases. For example, following the preliminary audit, the department calculated the weighted markup percentage of each liquor type applied an estimated percentage of sales to well call premium and cocktails made to calculate the markup percentage, and then applied the percentage of gross sales during happy hour and regular hours to determine the respective weighted markup percentages. The mathematical problem with this is twofold. First, the percentage of well call and premium sales can be calculated based on actual, actual purchase percentages per the sample invoices provided instead of an estimate. And second, the percentage of sales for discounted hours with the lower markup percentage is inherently skewed downward because the gross sales are lower when there are discounts. For example, a gin and tonic sold at $4 for happy hour and $6 during regular priced hours would produce a 40% to 60% breakdown of happy hour and regular hour sales. However, the actual cost percentage of these sales are equal 50-50 as they represent the sale of the same item in two different pricing periods. Performing the calculation as the CDTFA did unnecessarily increase the markup percentage and the estimate of the underreported sales. I can provide additional examples if necessary later, which I don't think is necessary. And although though these specific issues have been adjusted and agreed upon in the earlier appeals process, I would like to highlight that these corrections of the calculation so far have created a $1,324,092 reduction in the CDTFA's original estimate. Again, this is an estimate that was calculated using standard auditing protocols and what the CDTFA pro proposes to be industry norms. Once these inaccuracies were discovered and presented, the CDTFA agreed and has recalculated their estimated underreporting with a 74% reduction from their original work due to these calculation errors. As to the remaining two areas of dispute, which we presented during the field audit and the appeals process, I have attached exhibit one, page three, which explains that today we are requesting that at minimum, the costing utilized in the weighted markup should be based on pricing and costing during the audit period, not 2018, which is after the conclusion of the audit period, and two, the pour size for the martini glass of 6.03 ounces that was measured by Mr. Chow in the field and reported on the CDTFA form 1311 bar fact sheet, which is found in exhibit eight, page 103 to 104, should be utilized in the markup calculations. This bar fact sheet was signed and dated by the bar manager, Mr. Martin Crankle. In regard to the first issue, the CDTFA's utilization of 2018 pricing and costing during the preliminary audit. 
Mr. Chow agreed to and utilized the pricing as indicated on the bar fact sheet. However, in Exhibit 9, page 105, Mr. Chow notified us that he was switching the prices to the 2018 prices instead of 2016 prices because he made an error by using 2016 prices with 2018 costing in his work papers. He indicates an example of one brand of liquor that using the 2016 prices with the 2016 invoices, the markup would have been 112.33%. And with the 2018 pricing and invoices, the markup would have been 129.31%. He concludes that he made an error using old pricing and new costing. And instead of correcting the working papers to utilize the cost and prices that actually occurred during the audit period of 112.33%, he applied prices and costing outside the audit period, thus increasing the markup in just this one brand by approximately 17%. The matching principle, which is a standard principle in accounting, would be more closely represented using the pricing and costing during the audit period, not after. In the CDTFA letter dated September 23rd, 2022, and listed on the CDTFA exhibit list as exhibit I, page 434, Mr. Parker states that review of a prior audit performed on the appellant's business covering the period from April 1st, 2011 through March 31st, 2014, disclosed that the prices were lower than the claim prices for the period from January 1st, 2015 through September 30th, 2017. The pour sizes on the lower priced drinks are 2.1 ounces per serving. This is 0.71 ounces smaller than 2.89 ounce pour size used in the current audit's shelf test for liquor. It is apparent that the appellant increased the pour size and accordingly increased prices. Based on this analysis, any reduction to the prices should also include a reduction to the pour sizes used in the audit. <clears throat> Mr. Parker, like Mr. Chow, is agreeing in his statement with the appellant as to the prices between 2015 and September of 2017, which we are still arguing should be used in the audit working papers. I believe Mr. Parker is arguing that either the late 2014 or late 2017 price increase was made solely due to a managerial decision to increase drink sizes. <clears throat> Um, if he is referring to the 2017 price increase, when he asserts the assumption that the Lucky 13 made a calculated decision to increase both their pour size and their prices, he is claiming that the Lucky 13 calculated that it would be in their best interest to decrease their profit margin. In the previously referenced bar fact sheet, Exhibit 8, page 104, question 15, the CDTFA asks, are poor costs evaluated? The checkbox check for no is marked. The appellant was asked and answered this question. It was not the policy of the Lucky 13 to evaluate poor costs. <clears throat> Mr. K I'm sorry, Mr. Crankle, the bar manager, although he might have directed the selling prices, this was done by comparison to competitors, not by mathematical calculation, as Mr. Spears will discuss later. I would also like to mention that this morning I found the form 1311 bar fact sheet from the prior audit and Mr. Crankle's written answer next to question 15 as to whether the lucky 13 evaluates poor costs was not a check in the yes or no box. He wrote a question mark next to this question, indicating that he did not even understand what it meant. This was the manager in charge of prices. He did not understand what evaluating poor costs even meant at the beginning of this audit period and and at the end of the period, he marked no. I'm happy to upload a copy of this bar fact sheet. The CDTFA already has copies of it. In addition, Mr. Parker makes an assumption that the price increases were made at the Lucky 13 solely based on product sizing and not because of general inflation, increased insurance, minimum wage costs, utilities, inventory costs, and most importantly, competitor pricing. 
if Mr. Parker is arguing that the appellant should use the poor test from the 2011 to 2014 audit for the 2015 to 2017 audit, the working paper should also be using the costing and pricing from the 2011 to 2014 period. We are merely arguing that we should be consistent with the calculations utilizing poor tests, pricing, and costing from the current audit period. In addition, we would like to emphasize that Mr. Spears and the Lucky 13 did not appeal any of the decisions in the prior audit, including the poor size, as we are arguing today. In fact, he was overwhelmed by the complications of these working papers, the poor test, the weighted markup calculations, and the process itself. To rely on that audit in any way would be erroneous when we have proven that there can be upwards of a 74% margin of error when the CDTFA follows their auditing protocols. Lastly, as Mr. Spears will tell you later, he suspects that the prior audit poor test does not match with what he believes was accurate at the time based on the online reviews and general reputation of the business. That poor test resulted in a 2.18 ounce pour, which is only slightly higher than a standard pour and certainly not worthy of the reputation of cheap, strong drinks, as can be evidenced by the multitude of reviews included in the exhibits, which I will reference later. In addition, I have also included a cost comparison worksheet, Exhibit 3, pages 44 to 45. If you look sideways, and I do apologize, I'm not very good with organizing PDFs, so it's not rotated. The column at the top shows the cost comparison of the samples of liquor used to calculate the weighted markup. What is interesting here is that not only were the prices lower during the audit period than utilized in the CDTFA's calculation, a significant amount of the bottle costs in the early audit period were actually higher than in 2018. This reduction in bottle cost over time is represented by the neg negative numbers on the top column, column of Exhibit 3, pages 44 and 45. This tells us that not only does the matching principle need to be considered because of the price increases in late 2017 that was passed on to customers, but also due to the costing differences. We provided the evidence of bottle costs. The CDTFA agreed during the audit to prices per the bar fact sheet, and the CDTFA conducted a poor test in the field, including the cocktail sizes. We feel there is no reason to utilize anything other than the samples, pricing, and poor test as determined with the field auditor. As to the second issue of the poor size of the martini glass, Per CDTFA Exhibit I, page 434, again, the letter dated September 23rd of 2022, Mr. Parker states that the appellant also contends that the pour size should be increased to six ounces for a martini. However, the appellant has not supplied documentation as to the price of this specific martini drink. In response to this, we would like to refer back to Exhibit 8, page 103, in the third section of the bar fact sheet, section titled selling prices per drinks rows 7 through 10 show the selling prices for cocktails during the audit in addition exhibits 5 6 and 7 show the specs of the martini glasses and the invoices of purchases of these glasses by the lucky 13 during the audit period as shown on the manufacturer website this martini glass is an 8.25 ounce glass and the pour test as conducted by the field auditor produced a 6.03 ounce pour, showing the appellant was still leaving 20%, 27% of the glass unfilled, which for anyone that has ordered a martini would know this is commonplace, not an egregious overpour. Referring again to the night September 22nd, nope, September 23rd, 2022 CDTFA letter, Mr. Parker states, nor has the appellant shown if the sales of this particular martini drink is considered material. In response, Mr. Spears and I do not contend that the sales of the martini drinks is large. In fact, it is listed as only 5% of total sales. The adjustments of this has a very minor impact on the outcome of the working papers. However small that amount may be, it still represents sales tax that the appellant does not owe. Moving back to the CDTFA Exhibit I, page 434, the CDTFA states, 
The industry norm for pouring a drink with twice the amount of alcohol than other drinks is to increase the price as to not impinge on the profit margin. And that based on the department's experience, liquor pour sizes range between one and a half to two ounces per drink. Greater than a two ounce pour size increases the price of the drink. Higher selling prices compensate the business for the additional cost of the alcohol. In response to these statements, there are three issues here. The costing methodology of the Lucky 13, the pour size as, as, as evidenced by online reviews, and the lack of necessity for Mr. Spears and the Lucky 13 to change their operating procedures. As I mentioned previously, during the field audit, the manager of the Lucky 13 attested to the fact that the Lucky 13 did not evaluate pour costs. In addition, the CDTFA argues that the poor size is outside industry standards, and we agree. Throughout the audit process, Mr. Spears has provided multiple online reviews showing that the reputation of the Lucky 13 was one of quick, stiff, and cheap drinks. We have included some of these reviews in Exhibit 10, an article by Broke Ass Stewart, excuse my language, that's his name, who is an SF nightlight, nightlife reporter, and he reports the Lucky 13 has cheap well vodka, cheap drinks, where the pros come to drink. One of the only bars in the city that consistently does buybacks. Exhibit 11 is a seven by seven magazine article, which states that the Lucky 13 has what we believe to be the best happy hour in America. Exhibit 12 has Yelp and Google reviews stating the following, $4 mystery shots, the great part of it is the cheap booze, affordable spirits. The bartender was quick and poured a heavy dose. Cheap drinks, but kind of stinks. Be prepared to hold your nose Four beers under $20. Cheap drinks and cool bartenders. Neighborhood bar with great cheap beer and dogs. Cheap drinks, fun atmosphere, free popcorn. Cheap drinks, cool peeps, and some of the greatest bathroom poetry. Dive bar, cheap drinks. Great prices, free popcorn. PBRs are cheap. Cheap drinks and smoking patio. Generous single malt pours. $5 Pliny and good vibes, great prices. There are more in the exhibits. The CDTFA argument of matching the poor costs and pricing to industry norms is certainly relevant for determining averages, but there is no legal requirement to fall within industry norms. And per the obvious Google reviews, the reputation of the business is outside of these norms. Adding to this, the Lucky 13 was not managed for maximizing profit. Mr. Spears' career is in an entirely different industry. He made a $150,000 investment that required little to no work effort. He merely managed banking deposits, not even most of the check writing. He was fundamentally an absentee owner. He earned $4,000 a month salary for 20 years. Many of these years, the business also earned profits that added to his $48,000 annual passive income. This is a whopping 32% minimum passive return on investment per year, which is astronomical for an absentee owner, especially in this industry. And he will be able to recoup his entire investment when he sells the liquor license. As Mr. Spears will explain, the Lucky 13 manager, Mr. Crankle, had been in place in the man managerial position for the establishment prior to Mr. Spears' investment in the business. He was in charge with handling he was charged with handling vendor and customer relations, event planning, staffing, and scheduling. He is a very skilled front of the house manager. However, he has no understanding of calculation of poor costs, what industry averages are, or what cost of goods sold even means. Again, I can produce the prior form 1311 that shows that he didn't even understand how to answer that question. And although the combination of an absentee owner and an on-site manager that doesn't understand poor costs leads to minimalized profits and a lack of financial analytics for decision making, Mr. Spears had no reason to be concerned or upset about the money he was earning on his investment. He therefore had no reason to request poor cost analytics. In this unique instance, the bar staff was happy with the money they were making, the owner was happy with his return on investment, and the customers, as earlier referenced, were quite pleased with the establishment. 
Outside of this audit, there was no reason for any review of profit maximization. There is no requirement for a business to optimize its sales through pricing. There is no requirement to increase prices based on vendor costing. There is no requirement to increase prices based on minimum wage or insurance cost either. Most small business owners of the mom and pop variety do not have the time it takes or the resources, resources to focus solely on mathematical analytics. The combination of these factors and Mr. Spears' absenteeism and contentedness with his earnings are all reasonable factors that created a profit margin outside of industry norms. I have utilized the CDTFA working papers as a template where I recalculated the results with the pricing and costing from 2016 and included the martini glass pour size as measured on the on-site ports at the on-site pour test. These calculations are in Exhibit 2, pages 5 to 43. I do need to apologize and make a correction for the record. I copied the original working papers from the CDTFA files for this calculation, and in my copying and pasting, I did not realize until my review this week that Mr. Chow's name is still listed on these pages as the preparer. And I would like to make clear that this exhibit, Exhibit 2, was not prepared by the CDTFA office or Mr. Chow. My result when addressing these two issues shows a total of $268,433 in underreported sales with a balance due of $23,419. This amount is specifically shown on Exhibit 2, page 5, row 24, columns E and H. We are requesting that these calculations be taken into consideration and the audit be adjusted at a minimum based on the above arguments. This would reduce the outstanding balance due by $17,324. We are all sitting here for $17,324. Putting this into perspective, this is only a 0.96% reduction of the original preliminary audit results. Mr. Spears is asking for a reduction of less than 1% of the preliminary audit results based on the evidence as presented. I would also like to address the fact that Mr. Spears, as, as he will explain further, does not agree that the Lucky 13 had an additional $268,433 in taxable transactions that were not reported during the time frame. The preliminary audit results, the final audit results, the re-audit results and my calculations are all based on estimates of what a business could have sold given a very, very, very narrow sample of purchases in a short period of time with a convoluted calculation to extrapolate a possible outcome if and only if those exact products were purchased in the same proportion at the same cost over a three-year time period. Mr. Spears stands firm that the sales tax filings were reported accurately and no underreporting occurred. However, we both recognize that with our limited resources, the challenges of arguing these calculations and the delays that are holding up the sale of Mr. Spears license, it is our sincere hope that if nothing else, the minimal adjustments that I have detailed can be made so that we can move on or he can move on. That's all Mr. Spears. I believe you're muted. Uh, thank you so much, Laura. I think you really covered the uh, our position very, very well, uh, including some of the nuances of, of the ownership that I'm going to discuss now and how this business was run for the 20 years that I had. It. So just a little background on myself. I'm a general contractor and a uh, billing developer. Um, I'd never bartended in my life. i had been in bars, including the Lucky 13, numerous times, but never bartended. Um, in 2020, so just to keep uh, for the judges, I'm referring a lot to Exhibit 15, which is a narrative that I, a letter that I included in the exhibits, kind of giving background of my ownership. And I'm going to add some additional comments over and above what I included then. But the background on my ownership is I was approached by a realtor that I knew in 2020. He knew me as a small developer at the time who was also a general contractor builder 
I had built a few smaller projects, such as a pair of flats and single family homes. The Lucky 13 was going to be sold because the owner of that bar and about maybe six or seven others had been uh, had deceased and he was in charge of the estate. So he knew me, he thought, oh, this is a small piece of land. It's only 25 feet wide, 90 feet long. This might be something that I could purchase, not to own a bar, but to maybe demo it myself and build a small project there on a 25 foot wide lot, which I had done at that time, 2000, I had done previous projects like that. I did not have the capital to buy the land, but coincidentally, I just happened to know the guy that owned the lot next door, which was 50 feet wide. He was also another realtor that I had worked with and in fact, had sold some of my previous properties for me. We had a very tight relationship. I mentioned it to Bill Brown, the realtor that approached me to purchase the land and said, I can't buy it. I know the guy who can buy it. He's got the lot next door. He's a developer. He's done larger projects. He's the right guy. So that's what happened. Peter Naughton purchased a bar in 2020. And at that time, he said to me, Brian, I know nothing about bars. He was an older Irish gentleman. He goes, would you, you know, own the bar, and just kind of see, oversee it for me as a caretaker for three years? I'm going to immediately go in and get permits for a development project. So, you know, I hesitated and I thought about it. I went to the bar. I met Martin, who I liked. I kind of saw the situation there, that it was a real neighborhood bar. It, it, it was a prototypical dive bar. That's, that's what it was. Um, the lease was a one page lease and that's exhibit number 14. 14, thank you, Laura. Laura's much better than me. I have here in my notes. That's exhibit 14. So just to give you an idea, the lease was for three years. It was at $6,500 a month, no security deposit. That, my payment never changed over 20 years. I had the same fixed cost for 20 years. Uh, Mr. Naughton rapidly moved to get a demo permit approved. And I think he had one approved as early as one of his first demo permits as early as uh, fourth quarter of 2022. Uh, subsequently, the lot next door came for sale, which was a three unit building. That Brian, can I interrupt had... you for one second? Sure. You keep referring to 2020 and 2022, and I believe you're, you actually mean 2000 and 2002. Oh, yeah. Sorry, 2000. Thank you, Mark. 2000 and 2002. So in 2002, uh, he, he was approved for a, uh, a demo permit for the first time. And I included all of the planning exhibits. Probably Laurel beat me to this too. Um, exhibit 13, I believe, has all the permits. The permit history, and you'll see that at that time, the lot next door, which actually had the backyard patio for the bar at the time, the owner approached me to buy it. And I said, I don't want to buy it. I didn't have the funds at the time. Mr. Naughton, in addition to what he already owned, bought that property. So now he had 100 feet of frontage and he redesigned the building and resubmitted. And again, got permits for another building. It got appealed because of some landmark issues with the three unit building. He decided to sell it. And then 2008 hit, the economy crashed and development kind of ceased for a while. So I'm not going to go chapter verse over the 20 years of the permits. You'll see them there. But this bar in various articles, which we provided, was scheduled for demo numerous times, much to the concern of all the neighbors who loved the place. It was a real neighborhood joint. People would walk there from all over the neighborhood. Mr. Naughton wanted the bar to stay open and not be a closed shutter business because he did not have a demo permit in the beginning. And number two, it would be labeled an abandoned building by the city, which would cost him additional insurance funds and an annual fee to the city. And thirdly, for neighborhood goodwill. He had to get approval from the neighborhood groups 
to do a building there and shuttering a business three years or four years or five years prior to actually developing it would have created bad goodwill for him in his approval process. So that's basically how I came into the business. Laura's hit on a lot of the parameters of, of my role as an absentee owner. I had my own business to run. Uh, as Laura stated, I was making money. The rent never changed. I was able to make payments comfortably. I would occasionally go into the bar and bring friends in and be able to have some drinks, you know, to host my friends. It was kind of a sort of a charming little ownership for me. And I enjoyed it and I enjoyed the staff. I wasn't a bar owner. I, I didn't have the expertise or the time to, you know, start going into uh, pricing drinks and poor costs and, and profit margins. I was there as a caretaker. And that's how that's how I saw my role. And again, this lease was three years. And for the last 17 years, I was on a month to month basis. Never the lease never changed, which is really interesting and kind of unheard of. Uh, the building itself was dilapidated and, and Laura ma made a joke and mentioned, uh, you know, the conditions. Well, the joke kind of was once you got past the smell, you know, you could sit down and enjoy a drink. It was an old building. Bathrooms were in the front. Refrigeration was antiquated, led to, you know, probably a lot of lost beer and foam, especially on warm days. I was not going to invest capital in something that I thought could be torn down in six months or a year, you know, over and over and over. So it made no sense to me. The owner didn't want me to do that. And so those conditions persisted throughout my ownership. One thing I haven't hit on, the name Asswipe, and I know we're all laughing about it under our breath, and I used to get laughed at when I went to the bank. The entity that sold the bar business was called Alkeys. And it was a play on words. They called it Alkeys, two words. So I named the bar Asswipe. That's kind of an inside joke when I met him. So I thought I'd only have it for three years. So that's why the name was kind of part of how I viewed owning this bar. Um, we were audited in, the initial audit happened uh, 11, excuse me, 12, 13, 14 were the years that we were audited. And that number, while not as high as the 1.8 number that Mr. Chow came out with initially on, the current audit was also quite high. At the time, I was kind of shocked. Uh, you know, I appealed it as much as I could within the processes of the CDTFA. I did get that number reduced significantly. Um, the final results weren't realized and, and where we landed until 2016. This audit covers 2015. 16 and 17. And in 2016, when I had settled the previous audit, I did talk to the manager and staff, not all of them, but some of the staff and said, look, you got to lighten up on comp drinks, you know, self-consumption and, and just try to, you know, run a little tighter ship here. Again, that there was a pending demo. I never thought I'd get audited again. But if you look at the results from 15, 16, and 17, you will see we markedly improved in 16 and 17. Most of the underreported sales of this current audit are from 15, which is while I was still going through the previous audit. So things did improve. And uh, so I, I just think that should be noted. Um, you know, Laura already alleged to this, to think that I would tell to go into the bar and tell the staff to make stronger drinks so we could charge more. It's really, you know, kind of laughable based on my 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 ownership position and, and nothing I would even consider doing. We were known everywhere as the cheapest drinks in town, you know, strongest, cheapest, you know, broke ass stewards did every third drink was free. That I didn't see that article until 2020 when he wrote it, but he was referring to an earlier article he had written. So it, it gives you an idea of what the regulars experienced in there. And most of our business during happy hour, when we sold the cheapest drinks and we had a very large following was these regulars. So I'm sure they were getting a lot of comp drinks, uh, 
a lot of very strong drinks. And I do think in fairness to the CDTFA, it's way outside of industry norms. Certainly, certainly bars that they would audit that have a very accurate POS system, you know, cameras on the bartenders, you're not free pouring drinks. You could use those standards and, and come up with probably a pretty accurate number based on invoices. But in this situation, drinks were free poured. There was no cameras. You know, the bartenders were supposed to write down the cops they gave out. You know, whether they wrote them all down or not, I can't, it's, it's conjecture, but I have a feeling that it was a pretty loose situation in there. I wasn't in there at night. I actually, you know, recommended to Thomas Chow maybe. You know, send somebody in there on a, any night of the week. Just send somebody in there and order a drink, or send somebody you know in there and order a drink and tell me what their experience is, because, you know, I'm not making it up that these are strong drinks and this is how the business is run. I understand the CDTFA's positions and why would somebody run a business like that, but I think the nuances explain why I wasn't there for bottom line. And I, and I didn't own it in that type of business. Now, if rents increased every year 3%, which every other bar probably experiences minimally, uh, I probably would have had a different view of this. And I may have decided not to continue the month to month ownership for the owner and let him deal with it on his own. But that was not the situation here. So I, I'm just trying to give you a picture of why it, it appears that I ran a very sloppy business. And I'm giving you the reasons behind. Yes, I was very, very busy with my own business. I was a contractor working full time. And I, as things progressed from 2000 to 2020, I started to do much bigger and bigger developments, including in that neighborhood. So this was something I didn't spend a lot of time on. Uh, we've referred to the articles there in exhibits 10, 11, and 12. And there's numerous, you know, Yelp reviews, uh, newspaper articles that really back up what I'm saying. And these articles were written over the entire period of that uh, bar ownership from 2000 to 2020. Um, the poor test, I thought Laura addressed really well. The poor test, I think the first time around, my manager did it with the previous uh, auditor from the CDTFA. His name was Guangzhou, and very good, very nice man. In fact, I have no problem with the professionalism of the CDTFA throughout. They've been, they've listened to all of our concerns, they've adjusted accordingly, and they've been very professional to work with. So I have nothing negative to say about my experience. It took longer than I thought, and I, and, you know, a lot of that I think it can be alluded to the COVID. It, it slowed everything down, but you know, in that first poor test, there was, you know, Martin's first language is not English, he's German, and Guangzhou's first uh, language is not English either. So I think there was a little bit of miscommunication. Martin had never done it before. As Laura attested to, he doesn't understand, you know, he didn't run formulas on how to price drinks. And I think the confusion on, on some of the pores were, he got confused with a shot in a, a rocks class for drinks. And somehow it, it was like we poured like a jigger shot that you would see in a glass with a line, that was a large percent of our sales, which would be a measured pour, which in fact, that was a very small part of our sales. Most of all of our drinks were free pour. So anybody with you know bar experience and owning a bar knows that if you don't use a jigger and it's free pours and you're known as the strongest drinks in town, I would bet over 90% of those drinks weren't two ounce pours. That's just didn't happen in there. Two ounce pour is what you see in a place that pours drinks with a jigger. That's a measured pour. So again, that's just part of the nuances of why it seems like we're so outside of the norm. And I think Laura's hit those points extremely well. Um, you know, regarding, I, I'm also appealing the, the interest. And the reason I'm appealing the interest is that you know, the, the, re the first result came back to us, I'm going by memory here, at the end of 2019. And it was it was staggering. It was a shocking number. It was 
$8 million underpour. Didn't have the interest calculated at that point, but just the, uh, just the tax due was a large sum. I did feel based on my previous audit experience that we would be able to work on that number and get it down once we you know, dug in. I, I hired Laura because it was overwhelming for me. She'd been very helpful. She has background in the bar business. She's an, a, a bookkeeper. So, uh, you know, I really appreciate her due diligence in getting it already reduced close to 75%. But the number that wasn't reduced to a, even a more reasonable number until March of 2020, when it was reduced to approximately $880,000, I'm again going by memory, and with uh, interest, et cetera, the tax, the, the uh, total bill due was about $115,000. Now, remember, in March of 2020, that's when COVID started. So my bar shut down in, on March 15th. And uh, we didn't don't serve food in there other than the free popcorn that we alluded to earlier. So there was no money coming in. I was still paying rent because there was another new landlord at that time. We just purchased it a year prior. He didn't raise the rent, but I had to pay it. Um, and we were unable to open. So I had no money uh, coming in at all. I didn't have the funds sitting in that account to pay. And we were still working on our appeal. It wasn't until 2021 that the appeal was lowered, or excuse me, our or underreported was lowered once again to a more reasonable number of 400 and the current number at 460 or whatever that number is. Uh, again, at that time, I had already taken an SBA loan to pay the interest, and we had been closed since December of 2020. This business opened in the fourth quarter of 2020 for about two months. We could only open part time because business was um, sparse. We'd open on the weekends. Um, after that experiment, both myself and the staff, weren't, nobody was making enough money. I was paying rent. We shut the business down completely in December of 2020. And that building right now is still vacant. So, given the time, given the original amount that was due, and I didn't have the funds in that particular business to pay up front and wait later to try to debate if we owed it or not. And, and how long it took, a lot of it due to COVID and some slow responses maybe, but mostly to COVID, I think. I, I feel that uh, I should be relieved of the interest due based on these circumstances. And, and you know, Laura at the end, is arguing for a based on her data that she's provided with her accounting expertise, lowering this another seventeen thousand dollars of tax due and dropping the uh, underreported number down maybe close to another fifty percent. You know, and, and that's our goal here. I, I do want to say that I agree that you know. I'm not sure we underreported 300,000 sales. You know, whatever came into that bar, uh, you know, was, was deposited into the bank, and that's how we ran the business. I did some of the deposits. Uh, Martin did some of the deposits, and my wife occasionally would do deposit for me. But we still don't feel that we underreported a significant amount of sales. It might have been some of the other issues in the bar that uh, could have contributed to that that we've already talked about. Um, so that's pretty much my uh, statements with regard to my ownership role and uh, why I think that is material to the overall consideration of our appeal. And I will concede any extra time we have. Thank you, Mr. Spears. Uh, before we uh, move over to uh, CDJFA's combined opening and closing, I did have a brief question and then not sure who would be best to answer it. Perhaps it's uh, Ms. Weiss. Uh, but um, so 
With respect to the Martinis, um, could you define what you mean by pore size? I just want to make sure that we're not speaking past one another. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, I was looking for that. I was trying to get it there. Um, the Martini pore size, uh, when Mr. Chow came in, um, and I, the CDTFA could correct me if I have part of this wrong, I was not present. This is my understanding of what happened is they take, take each size of glassware that the business has and they have the bartender, just one of the bartenders, not everybody that worked there, do mimic what it would be to pour uh, the alcohol into that drink size. And then the field officer takes the glass and measures the amount of alcohol that was poured into each of the glass sizes. And for the martini glass in particular, the Libby 400 Cosmopolitan glass is a martini, a stemless martini glass that has just, it's a bulb at the bottom. So it's, it's just the V shaped glass. It's 8.25 ounces from the report. Again, I was not there. Mr. Crankle poured uh, 6.03 ounces into the martini glass. And then Mr. Chow took that martini glass with the 6.03 ounces and poured it into his measurement, you know, a measuring cup. Uh, again, I can be corrected if this is wrong. And then mark down what that pour size was on the bar fact sheet uh, 1311, which I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know the exhibit number, but uh, exhibit eight. Okay. And so um, with respect to the martinis, were there martini, I, this is, I guess, a bit, more factual, but in the evidence, will I find anything regarding the, the composition of those martinis? Uh, so, for example, some martinis uh, may be straight up. Uh, other martinis may be like a Manhattan uh, and have other like juice or additives into the, the martini that do not constitute like liquor. Totally. Um, there. Um... So in a in that range could be even wider than just a Manhattan or a Martini. It could be a Cosmo. It could be, um, you know, sometimes people just say, "Can you make me a bullet?" Uh, you know, shaken up with nothing else in it. So um, there is no, there was no, there was a question at some point in the audit about what cocktails, a sample of cocktails, and the answer i believe in the audit only had one type of booze which as we all know is not representative of any bar in the u.s over a three-year time period that only one singular type of booze would be used in that i'm sorry liquor not booze in any cocktail size or glass or uh, whatever there had there the lucky 13 as far as i know had no way of monitoring how much any one particular brand of alcohol liquor was utilized in a shot versus like if we use kettle one for example how many of the kettle one um drinks were actually sold in a shot versus a kettle soda versus a kettle martini there's no delineation of the those differences in sales there there are some times where there would be uh, triple sex, triple sec and cranberry juice or sweet vermouth and bitters in a Manhattan. Uh, but again, there, I, I don't have any access to any delineation of those type differences in the utilization of the martini glass. Okay. Thank you. Um, so at this time, I think we're going to switch over to CDTFA's uh, opening and closing presentation. If you're ready, Mr. Swazo. I'm ready. No other judges had questions. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for more questions after um, uh, CDTFA's portions concluded. Okay. But um, I guess I, in your presentation at some point, uh, even if it's just the closing, could you define what pore size means according to the department's position? Sure. Thank you. Okay. The appellant operated a bar doing business as Lucky 13 in San Francisco, California. The business was previously audited for the period from April 1st, 2011 through March 31st, 2014. The audit period to be discussed today is from January 1st, 2015 
through December 31st, 2017. Records reviewed included federal income tax returns for 2015 and 2016, profit and loss statements, general ledgers, bank statements, and purchase invoices. The appellant utilized two crash cash registers. However, no sales tapes were maintained to verify prices of drinks, percentages of types of drinks sold, or recorded sales amounts. Credit cards were not accepted and sales were cash only, Exhibit B, page 21. Comparison of federal income tax returns recorded sales to sales and use tax returns reported sales disclosed no discrepancies. Review of the federal income tax returns disclosed a small loss for the combined two year time period and minimal wages paid. Exhibit F, page 308. Bank deposits were also compared to sales and use tax returns reported sales for the audit period and revealed that not all sales were deposited into the appellant's bank account. Exhibit F, pages 306 and 307. The department calculated appellant's markup using sales and use tax returns reported sales to alcoholic beverage purchases per G for the general ledger. This markup was just under 107 percent. Exhibit F, page 305. The markup is considered unreasonable because it is far below the industry averages. In addition, the prior audits audited markup of 214 percent. Exhibit H, page 360 is more than double this audit's recorded markup. As a result, the department used alternative methods to determine if appellant had unreported taxable sales. A purchase segregation was performed for the third quarter of 2016 period. The purchases were segregated into the following categories. Well liquor, all and premium liquor, wine, bottled beer, craft beer, mixed and miscellaneous beverages, along with supply items. Weighted percentages for each category were computed. Exhibit H, Exhibit E, pages 260 to 265. Shelf tests were conducted on the aforementioned categories using purchase invoices provided by the appellant for April and May 2018, and the appellant's prices per the bar fact sheet. Exhibit F, pages 309 and 310. Bottled beer markup was adjusted for 1% breakage allowance. Exhibit E, pages 258 and 259. Draft beer markup was adjusted for regular and happy hour pricing and a spillage allowance of 10%. Exhibit F, pages 294 and 297. Wine markup was adjusted for a 6% allowance for spillage. Exhibit F, page 291. Well, call and premium liquor markup was adjusted for various pour sizes based on the type of glass used and the percentage of liquor as estimated by the appellant on the bar on the bar fact sheet exhibit e page 257 happy hour and regular pricing and a 12 percent spillage allowance was also granted exhibit e pages 251 to 256. the shelf test markups were applied to the weighted purchase percentages of the segregation test to calculate an overall weighted markup of just over 167% on alcoholic beverages. Exhibit E, page, page 250. This markup is lower than the prior audit's markup of 214%. Then the department calculated the audited cost of goods sold. Exhibit E, page 249. Using the general ledger purchases of alcohol, Exhibit F, page 285, reduced by the taxpayer agreed unreported self-consumption, Exhibit F, page 282, and Exhibit H, pages 376 to 378, and pilferage of 2%. The markup factor was applied to the audited cost of goods sold to calculate audited taxable sales of close to $2.7 million. The audited taxable sales were compared to sales and use tax reported taxable sales of $2.3 million and a difference of $375,000 $375, was computed. Exhibit E, page 249. The total taxable measure assessed in the audit is $468,000, which is from the $375,000 in unreported taxable sales 
at $91,000 in unreported taxable self consumption. Exhibit F, Exhibit E, page 242. Sorry. Appellant claims drink prices changed in February 2018, and markup should be based on the pricing for the period from January 2015 through January 2018. As stated in the department's additional reply brief, Exhibit I, pages 434, review of the prior audit performed on the appellant's business covering period from April 1st, 2011 through March 31st, 2014, disclosed that prices were lower than the claim prices for the period from January 1st, 2015 through September 30th, 2017. The porter sizes on the lower prices drinks are 2.18 ounces per serving. This is 0.71% ounces smaller than the 2.89 ounce pour size used in the current audit shelf test for liquor. The shelf test in the prior audit used selling prices and purchase invoices for the months September and October 2014. Exhibit H, pages 360 through 374. Bar industry average for liquor drinks is about 1.5 to 2 ounces. The 2.89 ounce pour used to establish a markup on liquor for this audit is significantly greater than the industry average. In addition, appellant did not show any increase in prices associated with the larger pour sizes. Exhibit I, page 434. <clears throat> Generally, the department's experience is that selling prices go up when costs increase to maintain the same profit margin. The prior audit's markup of 214%. Exhibit H215, or Exhibit H, page 360, sorry. In this audit, markup decreased to 167.25%. Exhibit E, page 250. If the higher markup established in the prior audit is applied to the audit of purchases, then the appellant's liability would increase. The department used accepted audit methods, which include using appellant's purchase rec purchasing records. Despite appellant's lack of documentary evidence, the department accepted sales prices as provided by the appellant, allowed generous pour sizes, and permitted standard allowances as adjustments. The audited markup of 167% is less than half of the industry average for a full service bar. Based on the foregoing, the department has shown that its determination is reasonable and the appellant has not provided sufficient evidence or other documentation to prove otherwise. Appellant has also requested interest relief and submitted a Form 735. Based on analysis by department, there were no periods of unreasonable delays attributable to CDF, CDTFA offices, bureaus, units, and sections for the audit and appeal pursuant to Revenue and Taxation Code Section 6593.5. Therefore, interest relief is not recommended. It should be noted that no interest was accrued for the period from March 20th through June 20th or March 2020 through June 2020 due to the COVID pandemic. In relation to the um, pour size, the pour size is the amount of liquor that's actually poured into a drink. Therefore, when you're doing a martini, let's say, most of the time when you see a martini being done, it's going to have uh, vodka or gin. They're going to pour it in some ice. They're going to either shake it or stir it. They're going to pour it into the glass. They might have put vermouth in before, or they might coat the glass with vermouth, the dry vermouth, splash it out, and then put it in and put in um, olives along with a toothpick. So that's going to take up some room in there. The thing with the 6.03 pour size is if it's got the ice in there, not ice, but when you shake it or stir it, the ice is going to melt into the martini into the, with the liquor. So when you pour it or you strain it into the glass, it's going to show a larger size than it actually is. So in the first audit, what happened was they allowed the 3.33% because that's what was documented and that was, was verifiable. In the second audit, they were going to do an undercover pour test. However, the business was already closed, so they couldn't do the undercover pour test. This is documented in both the decision on page... <laughs> This is documented in the decision on uh, Exhibit B, page 28, and it's also talked in detail on Exhibit A, pages 6 through 8. 
This concludes our presentation. I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Spazzo. Um, so I do have a few questions um, and we'll have questions for both of the parties, but um, so appellant indicated that they would like to submit the bar fact sheet from the prior audit. Uh, I see that CDDFA has provided a copy of the prior audit uh, at exhibit H. Um, is there an objection to appellant submitting um, a copy of the prior audit bar fact sheet into the record? The prior audit bar fact sheet's already in our uh, exhibits. It's uh, exhibit H, page 406 and 407. Okay. Got it. Thank you for uh, locating that for me. Um, so uh, we won't need to address that. Um, Let's see. Um, at this time, I was going to uh, refer it over to my panel members to see if they have questions for either of the parties. Um, Judge Stanley, do you have any questions for either party? I don't have any additional questions other than what has already been asked. Thank you. Uh, Judge Long, do you have any questions for the parties? I do i have a question for appellant i just wanted to clarify um i understand the contention of how the um, measurement was taken with respect to the martini and how an amount was poured into the glass and it's approximately 27 percent less than the capacity of the glass um, but also in this case my understanding is that the shelf test is based on the markup of the liquor that ends up in the glass, um, as opposed to the drink on the whole, it, is it your contention that if a customer ordered a martini at the Lucky 13, um, they would receive six plus ounces of actual liquor, or is it a combination of the liquor and um, other additions? Brian, would you like me to address this? You're on mute. Yes, please, Laura. <clears throat> I, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I can't be absolutely certain as to every drink that was poured in there and the uh, pouring habits of each of the staff members. Um, nor can I attest to what percentage of those glasses were used merely for martinis versus some other concoction. Um, I would say that I do have a question for the CDTFA, which is that <clears throat> in the pour test, it's my understanding that the bartender was asked to pour the alcohol as they would for a drink, which to me as a regular customer of a bar would mean you would pour what you would pour into the shaker that already has the, the ice in it. And then that would be the amount that is un um, mixed that Mr. Chow was measuring. So to speak um, that if I was actually making a martini, I would put the shaker on the bar, I would fill it with ice, and then I would do maybe a six count pour, shake it and strain it into the martini glass. And my understanding was not that the measured um, diluted martini was the measured amount, but the actual alcohol that was poured into the shaker is what Mr. Chow was measuring. I could be wrong and I you know, open to feedback from the CDTFA. Um, I would say that there is a good possibility that there were bartenders that were putting six ounces in that glass, um, that there is a good possibility that because of how loose management was and how loose uh, the employees were, that there were probably times where that martini glass was filled to the tippity top, as has happened before um, in many places, depending on what's going on. I would say that it's very unlikely that the ice in a shaken martini would account for three ounces 
in a um, martini glass. I know that from experience in the bar industry for the 30 some odd years that I've been in the bar industry that the um, bruising of the ice does not create three ounces uh, uh, during the making of a martini. Um, I think there's ambiguity there. I don't think that there is a clear and concise answer. I do think it's very unlikely that the bar staff with how loose and unruly that the whole business was that they were filling any portion of their martinis to a third of the glass. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Okay, um, I think I have an answer. Thank you. Um, I have no more questions. Uh, thank you, Judge Long. Uh, I believe Judge uh, Stanley had a question. Yes, um, I had a question about the glass sizes. I see the spec sheet that you um, provided, but I was wondering um, if that glass size changed between the first and second audit. Of the specifically the martini glass? Yes. I don't know, as I was not the bookkeeper for the business and its general operations, I've only assisted in the calculations with the working papers of the audit. I do did look through all of their Grenier purchases, which is the company that they purchased the martini glasses from, and I provided in exhibit seven, pages 101 to 102 the invoices of the lucky 13 purchasing these glassware this glassware as early as 2016. i i can't attest to any purchases prior to that prior to that or from the prior audit but i do know that there is an invoice from grenier that is included in the exhibits that shows the purchase in 2016. okay this is judge stanley um thank you that, that's all the questions i have Thank you. This is Judge Aldrich. Um, this question is for CDTFA. Um, the changes that occurred from the initial measure um, to the uh, measure that is currently before us, um, was it because C CDTFA received additional documentation or um, I guess, could you speak to that? Could you repeat uh, that? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, so um, I was asking CDTFA uh to explain um if the the reason for the changes from the original audit to the re-audited measure uh and whether or not um appellant had provided additional documentation thank you ready yes uh basically there was a change and they had the hour allotment it went from uh, forty percent happy hour to six percent happy hour. Although the prior audit, when they did a uh, a test, which occurred, I believe, in September of September first, two thousand fifteen, to September seventh, two thousand fifteen. Uh, this is on exhibit. I'm putting exhibit B, page twenty eight, but I think that's wrong. Um, Anyway, in the prior audit, what happened was um, they did a test, and what they found out was 37% of the sales occurred during the happy hour, and 62.85% and occurred during the regular time. So by allowing this flip-flop, to say, they did give up a lot of um, the, um, the measure in that, in that particular instance. Okay, other stuff, uh, there was documentation provided. I can't tell you off the top of my head because, you know, I had to go into in-depth research to look at it. Um, but the problem that we had was that, again, they're asking for reductions and they're asking for changes, but they don't have any documentation to support the changes. The problem is they had two crash registers Neither one of them is a POS system. We can document the percentage of sales. We can document what type of sales occurred. We can't document the prices that that are actually occurred. All we're relying on is what a person gave us on a bar fact sheet. And uh, so we gave them a large allowance 
in leeway when we did our audit. That's why the, measure, the, the amount of markup is only 169. On a full service bar, the markup is generally between 300 to 450 percent for a full service bar. This is less than this is less than half of that on average. Um, the pore sizes are astronomical at 2.89. Again, average pore size is 1.5 to 2.0. Most of them are going to be 1.5. As the taxpayer's representative said, she would do a six count. The six count is of one and a half ounce pore. Okay. They're also talking about that they're loose in their controls of the inventory. However, wouldn't it also be assumed that they would be loosing their controls of the amount of cash coming in and the amount of sales occurring? Because if they don't have internal controls, they can't actually say that they know for sure what the sales are. We did a calculation to find out what the sales are. We know that the sales are incorrect. They acknowledged, at least in part, that the sales were incorrect when they did their re-audit on their own. Okay, the problem with the re-audit is, again, they're using the prices of 2018, I believe. They're using prices of 2018, April and May, but they're comparing them to prices prior to October 2017. Okay, so we didn't use that. <laughs> The pore size went up 0.7 over seven cents, seven ounce, 0.7 ounces, which is quite an increase in a year and basically a year's time from, or a little bit over a year's time from when the prior audit happened to the when this audit occurs. As to the um, situation where the internal controls are almost gone, there's there's a basically a problem that we have is that. You know, as we stated before, the markup is just too low. It appears that it's too low. We have done adjustments to try and facilitate the audit to go through. They're asking for uh, certain accommodations into their audit, but they have no proof to support that those accommodations should be uh, granted. Thank you, Mr. Suazo. Uh, I believe that concludes the questions from the panel. Um, at this time, I'd like to give uh, the appellant five minutes for a rebuttal or um, closing. Lauren, um, do you want to? Uh... Sure. Um, in response, I would say um, a couple, in addition to the, the evidence and exhibits that I've already discussed, I think one of the major faults here is relying on the prior audit when during, I did do some review in the prior audit. It certainly wasn't as in depth as I did during this audit. And there are some specific items that I discovered in this audit that had a vast um, mathematical difference in the calculations that we didn't try and have discussions with the CDTFA in the prior audit. In addition, uh, Brian didn't go through the appeals process, didn't try to have a hearing with you guys for that audit. And I think that um, he was not pleased with what the results were, nor did he believe that that was accurate, particularly the pore size from the prior audit being only 2.18 ounces. Um, and I think that that should be taken into consideration that Brian does feel like his pore size for his staff was astronomically outside of the industry norms. Um, and, you know, the proof that we did provide was, uh, you know, the articles and uh, reviews that we found. We have proof of purchasing this martini glass. We have the poor test that Mr. Chow witnessed and he wrote down the size of the alcohol that was put into that glass. Um, I think that we have uh, used as much written evidence and evidence of what Mr. Chow has said himself um, that this isn't the, the utilization of the prior audit as a marker or a benchmark for what this business was actually doing is not accurate. And that, um, again, Mr. Spears agrees that it, it should be outside of the industry norms. And the fact that, you know, as Mr. Spears attested to today, this was not a business that was uh, mon monitored for how much the poor costs were. They were just selling according to it, the way that it had been operating before he got there, and nobody ever thought twice about it because everybody was making money. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spears, anything else uh, before we conclude? I think Laura summarized it quite well. Just the entire staff 
including the meander, was there when I acquired the bar. Both of them were there when I closed the bar in 2020. So all these practices were in place. Um, regarding the poor test, I do think there was some confusion on Martin's part when he did it. Um, I'm not sure that he accurately poured what was really going on with both himself and the rest of the staff when they're in there with all the regulars and pouring their drinks and doing their thing. And, you know, it's anecdotal, but you're not going to get as many articles and people referencing the strongest drinks, cheapest, strongest drinks in town with every third or fourth drink a comp, unless there's some, you know, truth to it. And a two ounce drink, I'm sorry, that's that's not going to be strong in the in the dive bar industry. So, you know, I'm I'm sorry, and I and I and I understand the CDTFA, we don't have real factual concrete POS systems to back up what we're saying. However, uh, you know, I think we did present, I, I do think it's difficult for them to accurately uh, audit it because of that, but I do think we prevent enough evidence to try to give an idea of what this bar was like. And I'll just leave it at that. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone for your time. Uh, we're ready to conclude the hearing. Um, the record is now closed and the panel will meet and decide the case based off of the evidence and arguments presented today. Um, we'll send both parties our written decision no later than 100 days from today. Uh, there is another hearing this afternoon, uh, which will begin at 1 p.m. Uh, please cut the live stream and everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.